Okay, folks, I will call the meeting to order at uh, 5 o'clock p.m. Um, we've heard from Councillor Alfano that he is not going to be able to uh, be with us tonight because he is uh, delayed in travel. And uh, and we have uh, uh, Councillor Cohn uh, remotely. So, uh, Palin, would you uh, introduce yourself? Hello, Pilling Cone, um, District 2. Oh, and you're muted. Could you? There we go. Should I? Yes. Can you hear? Okay, now we go. Yeah. Pilling Cone, District 2. Great. Thank you. Okay. I'll mention, mention a few things about meeting logistics and remote. Uh, Instructions, uh, anyone who's uh, appearing remotely, ask you to indicate your uh, first and last name on your screen so that uh, we know who we're talking to. Um, anyone who wishes to address the council on, on any matter uh, must be recognized by the chair. And uh, for our usual procedures, we uh, ask you to limit your uh, comments or questions to two minutes, and uh, Ms. Prim will assist us with uh, with time. I mean, sorry, three minutes, and Ms. Prim will ask you will uh, help us with the timekeeping. Um, and we would ask you throughout the meeting to keep your comments or questions germane to the topic at hand. Um, the next item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Um, we know there is considerable uh, public interest in uh, goings on up at uh, Country Club Road. And so we will uh, take add that item to the agenda under other business right after the uh, consent agenda. And so we'll take that with, uh, with an introduction by uh, by the city manager, uh, questions and discussion among council and questions, comments and discussion from members of the public. Um, with that is, can we consider the agenda approved? Okay, consider the agenda approved. Next item is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is not on tonight's agenda. And so what happened up at, uh, what what's happening up at Country Club Road is on the agenda and we will reserve those comments for that agenda item. But other items, other topics that are not on the agenda, members of the public are invited to address the council for uh, no more than uh, three minutes, uh, Mr. Whitaker. Am I acknowledged? Uh, Stephen Whitaker. Um, the review of the contract with Green Mountain Transit includes their maintenance of the bike path along the transit center, the stairways, and the landscaping along the bike path along the building that might be interpreted to include all the way to the end of the parking lot. But the paid for landscaping was all mowed and left in a pile months ago and still left in a pile. And Confluence Park abutting that still hasn't been mowed since last or the sand and silt removed, nor the sand and silt from around the granite benches or the stairways. None of that has been done since last July floods. So I believe that we are way past due on enforcing the contract with Green Mountain Transit and their obligations. The Parks Department or the contractor for Downstreet, which maintains the landscaping along the lawn and the parking lot might be the best, uh, most cost-effective way to keeping Confluence Park, whether it's called a park or not. Uh, looking less than an abandoned field, you know, abandoned. Uh, that needs attention. 
Secondly, consider we last time we considered ways to benefit the businesses. An idea that occurred to me that we get a twofer is that we suspend metered parking for the interim and make it a downtown attractive to businesses because there's no fees for parking. And we shift that revenue to vigorously enforcing the vehicles that have modified mufflers that are rolling coal, intentionally blasting noise uh, and blocking the crosswalks. Uh, I've got plenty of photos of vehicles blocking the crosswalks, including trucks and the trucks using the Jake breaks downtown, it's over a hundred decibels and they have these engaged even when they're trying to speed up going into the next gear. So the cacophony of this noise pollution and uh, toxic, there's some sporty redneck trucks that are blasting out as much black smoke and noise as they can. But those are enforceable things that are in the ordinance that we could generate this probably equivalent revenue to offset any parking losses. There's also staff savings from not enforcing the parking. We are already paying the police and they would have, they'll be the ones have to enforce those. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. I, I like the idea of enforcing uh, nuisance behavior by drivers. You know, we don't uh, enforce our uh, motor vehicle ordinances as a, as a revenue generation mechanism, but that, that kind of bad behavior I think if it's observed, we should get on it. Um, any other member of the public here to speak? So. Just for both, I'd like to introduce Fire Chief Derek Libby. He's first week on the job, just started Monday. So his first council meeting. So welcome, Chief. Okay, I think that is it for the consent agenda, and we can move on to uh, item number five, the amendments to the uh, to our purchasing policy. Is and that finance director will mm -hmm. make a couple quick comments? Hi, uh, Sarah Lacroix, finance director. Um, so I've presented you all with an amended purchasing policy for your review and approval. Um, our current policy was last updated in 2011. Um, the amounts in it are much lower than what we're experiencing at market rates today for making purchases, it, along with federal guidelines have changed significantly since 2011 as it relates to uniform guidance and procurement of funds with federal dollars. And a lot of that language that is required now was missing from this policy. Um, one of my goals was to update all of the finance policies, um, given that we will have a large influx of federal funds with FEMA and other related grants, it felt prudent to do this now. Um, in addition, you know, we are struggling to provide the best services to our rate payers in, within the confines of our policy. Um, the best example I can give is currently we have the school street, and if they were required to follow all of the sealed bid process as is in here now, we wouldn't have the time to allow for that to happen. So we would have to utilize our current contractor, which would, based on the numbers, you know, we bid out and later to be approved would run us another $95,000 on this project. So allowing us this flexibility to work within these different thresholds and to solicit bids, not necessarily sealed bids, but bids that we feel are comfortable and adequate and presented to you all um, will help us go a long way in providing the best services to our community at the best rate possible, making that dollar go a little bit further. Um, I don't have a lot else to say about it. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, we upped the dollar thresholds um, quite a bit from the original, but they also were very low in the original. But I think that this covers us in a way that I feel comfortable managing and we aren't at risk for violating our own policy to do what's best for the city. Thanks, Sarah. Anyone have any questions? Uh, Carrie. Thank you. Um so uh, thanks for updating it. This is great. We obviously need this. Um, just a procedural question. Um, is, is this appearing on the agenda where it is because we need to change the policy in order to approve things that are on the consent agenda? That's correct. Okay, 
Great. Um, and then I have one more question, which is, I noticed that there is um, stuff in here about the Davis-Bacon Act and compliance with that. And I wonder if there's an opportunity to put our responsible employer ordinance in here as well, just to indicate that for construction projects over $200,000 that they will need to comply or that, you know, something equivalent to that in here. Wonder if that makes sense. Yes, I, that definitely is something that can be added. I was focusing on the federal guidelines, yeah. but you know, if that yeah. is the way we move ahead, I absolutely can add that in a similar section to where the Davis Bacon um, appears. Hey, our, our thought of that was that is our local ordinance. Davis Bacon is something that's, you know, controlled. That's not ours, so we should reference in our policy, but it's our own ordinance and our own ordinance. We got to follow it, yeah. whether it's in yeah. our policy or not. We have to do it, but we can add it for sure. Anybody else? Okay. Any members of the public? All right. Is there a motion? Okay. I'll move to approve the first one policy as presented. What is that? Second. Okay. Okay. Um, the second. So, sorry, I shouldn't make it so much of a sermon. I would like to move to amend that motion to include reference to the Montpelier Responsible Employer Ordinance. Is there a second? Okay. Motion seconded. So carried. Oh, I I just I don't think we need to come up with the with the wording right now. I think we can trust the staff to put the wording in there. I just want it to be referenced in there. Yeah, I, I can put a bullet following the one about Davis Bacon that references our responsible employer ordinance and the dollar threshold for that. And then I will, if we all prove this now, I'll put this in your packet next time for signatures. Okay. I think okay. we had planned to have a conversation about the responsible wage piece. And I would like to have that before this is included in any other ordinances. And it came to us from staff that it it's something that would be at least be worth looking at and considering. And I think some members of the council really didn't know it was there or were familiar with it. So I I would rather not see it in this tonight and and be a part of a future discussion as we committed to have. Lauren. Well, I wonder if we're just referencing the policy, we could still change the policy and then without having to go back and change this. I I mean, I hopefully we're not, we wouldn't be considering scrapping the policy altogether, but we might amend it. And so as long I would just, I think I would support including just a reference to it here that will presumably have some kind of responsible um, purchasing, whatever, <laughs> whatever the right uh, phrase of the or of that. Responsible um, employer ordinance. Responsible employer ordinance. Um, but then- yeah, if we just leave it kind of just referencing that, then that can be changed. And then that can kind of keep this updated without having to keep changing this policy to reflect specifics, if that works. Mm -hmm. Does that address your concern, Tim? Does that address your concern? Not at all. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any other uh, discussion? All right, we are voting first on uh, Councilor Brown's motion to amend uh, the motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. We'll do a roll. And yeah, we're gonna have to do a roll call. Uh, Pearl? Aye. Cone? Aye. Nini? Brown? Yes. Gill? Yes. That's four. Okay. We've adopted it. We've amended the motion. We've amended it. Yes, I correct myself. We've amended the motion. Now we are, uh, we have before us the uh, purchasing policy amendment as amended. Are we ready for that vote? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay, roll call again. Pearl? Aye. Cone? Yes. Heaney? No. Brown? Aye. Gill? Yes. All right, now we have adopted it. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah.
Okay. Next up, we have the consent agenda. And uh, by request, we are uh, taking, we are pulling items D, E, F, and G from the consent agenda, leaving items B and C, because I understand there are no minutes to uh, to pass. Yeah. So, go, were you gonna say I something? Just said soon. Okay. <laughs> So is there a motion to approve the consent agenda, which would which is totally exclusively items B and C? Approve the consent agenda, items B and C. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Let's just take up D, E, F, and G individually. Uh, so Kurt is on. Um, these are mostly public works things with the exception of the building. So I'll have him quickly run through these. The Bailey Avenue debris removal contract. Uh, hi, this is Kurt Mott, public works director. Um, so, uh, during the flood, we had uh, um, uh, several trees and a lot of gravel and things accumulated underneath the Bailey Avenue bridge. And um, since that and subsequent um, uh, events, uh, high water, high rain events, uh, we've had trouble at the bridge where, um, you know, the bridge has been in danger of getting damaged due to the high levels um, and the kind of the obstruction underneath the bridge. So um, <clears throat> this was identified in the, uh, in the J July 23 flood as an issue through FEMA. And um, we went through the procurement um, requirements, you know, public bid. Uh, got several bids for the project, and we're recommending to award to the low bidder, uh, Magnum um, Construction, um, to move that debris from underneath the bridge. Um, it should be primarily uh, covered by the FEMA funding. And as far as you know, they're a responsible, um, incredible uh, contractor. Yes, we had a meeting with them. Um, they've been in business for about five years. They've done um, similar type work. Um, and we feel they're qualified to do this project. Okay. Any questions? Why don't we go through all of them and then maybe we can do a motion to approve all, all four. What about item E, the school street curbing and resetting contract or curbing resetting contract? All right. So we, we put the, the curb reset in the bid for the school street project as an addendum. Um, the contractor, um, we only get one bid for school street. And um, after we opened bids, they indicated they didn't have capacity to actually do that work. Um, <clears throat> so we looked at other options. There are only a few contractors that specifically are specialized in, in setting curb. So we reached out to those um, three uh, contractors and um, got a price that's much more favorable than the original bid um, at $20 a foot. Uh, so there's a cost savings, but also, um, you know, this was, as Sarah mentioned, one of the reasons for amending the purchasing policy uh, is to allow us to solicit for bids um, for qualified contractors in order to expedite the, uh, the work because we don't have uh, a lot of time to do um, separate sealed um, state, state website advertised bids. And so we're recommending of the uh, to award the lowest, um, the lowest uh, bid received for that work, which is $20 per foot of remove and reset curb. Okie doke. Uh, thank you. Um, item F. I'll, I will get to you, Steve. But I'll, I'll yeah. But I want to. I'll. I, I think I'll go through all four of these and then actually to to anticipate the question because Councilmember Heaney asked me this and Councilmember Gill asked this as well. This does include both sides of the road, or at least the Bethany Church side down to where the the work heading uh, was done for District Heat about ten years ago. So it does include both sides of the both sidewalks on about half of the Bethany side to where the, it was done before. So I think that's what you were going to ask. Uh, and it does indeed. Initially it didn't. And now that's been added. Damn, you're good. <laughs> Item yeah. uh, F, school street culvert lining. Okay. Uh, sorry. I dropped off there for a second. I'm back. Um, so the, this was um, attempted to be proposed through change order um, to the contractor. Again, the price was much higher than uh, we expected. So we, again, solicited this is 
to uh, qualified contractors and recommend to award the, the less responsive bidder. Okay, council, any questions about that? And item G, building repair bids for finance and the fire station. So this one has actually been handled by Chris Lumbra, who was out today with a bad tooth. Um, so I'm going to try to do my best. It, we we could wait if you'd like, but basically this is to do uh, essentially temporary repairs to the city hall and fire station areas that have been da were damaged last year in the flood to at least put them back to more functional uh, areas. We we got uh, really huge wide range of prices, but the the low bid was very competitive. Really understands the work. Uh, we're not sure why the range was so high, but we're very comfortable that SR services can do what it is we need to do, and we'd recommend that we go ahead with that. Okay. Karen. I can just ask a question about the process for bids. It looks like um, the request for bids was put out, and 24 hours later was the the, the due, the due, the deadline. So is that no. that normal procedure? Because the, the letters dated August 12th and bids were due August 8, 13th? No, no. I think that was the letter to us that was, no, the bids are, were out for two or three weeks, I think, at least on these. Yeah, there's a, yeah, no, we wouldn't turn that around that quickly unless it was an emergency. We can get to the exact dates of when that went out. I don't know it off the top of my head. Maybe someone will know it before the meeting's over. Yeah, Kelly, it looks like you might have that information. Okay. Thanks. So what? why does it say August 12th on all of the bid documents? Well, that was the due date. Okay, great. Lauren. Uh, just a quick question about the like short-term repairs for fire station and city hall, are those FEMA reimbursable or is yeah. that awesome? And I presumably nothing is being, we're not investing in any construction that precludes future decisions. It's just getting us kind of operation we have for now. It's like that are not complaint that need to be sheet rocked and carpets that need to go back in and things like, you know, Great. things like that compressors that need to be put in places. So thanks. All right, Steve. I'd like to just spend a moment on the school street project. I think that we need to consider, and I've sent all of y'all a memo on this probably two weeks ago uh, that related to teeing off the district heat while we've got that street open. We have, we tend to have a habit of re-ripping into new work uh, because we didn't think it through, but that potential housing development, dense downtown housing development, necessitates that we take take an opportunity and and I, there's further research needed to whether there's a time expiration of two years or something on whether how long a district heat T can last. But while we're trying to make the district heat system uh, run in the black, so to speak, or balance the books, we need to take every advantage of every opportunity to bring more customers on and it would be a shame to have to dig into the brand new paving of School Street because we didn't tee off uh, and create an easement, say, across John Russell's land, uh, potentially pick up the Trinity Church and whatever goes in further behind there. Um, that Now's the time to do that. Uh, there's some drainage issues off of the Bethany that need to be addressed that that water volume of water and snow melt goes across the top of the walkway and creates ice that creates a real hazard. And it, in light of our short staffed DPW and the time at which they get out there and the time at which people are parking and walking into town from there, that ice is a hazard. So we can either collect that drainage on the south side of the walk and run it directly into the stormwater system while we're doing this or uh, consider, anyway, I think I've made the point that we, I'm glad that you're, you're, you're assuring the council that the first half of School Street on the south side is gonna get redone. Those curbs need to be eight inches, not 12 or 13, because they block 
door openings on low vehicles and they scratch up cars and they create a real problem. So, uh, Steve, when you said it goes over, the water runs over the walkway, do you mean the sidewalk on the south side of the school, school correct. street? Okay. Both at the east and the west corner of Bethany Church, that walk, that whole parking lot behind Bethany drains to the right in front of the door. That was the emergency overflow shelter prior years. And people were having to climb over inches of ice to get into the shelter at night. And that that water is also puddling at the front corner, and it could easily be captured there and run under the sidewalk directly into the... So now's the time to do that kind of work and, and really make this an example of the standard. I even suggested in that memo that we do navigation. A lot of people need to find Social Security and the bakery and the library mm -hmm. and navigation for sight impaired people. Uh, it's a great little pilot project for that. Bill, I also hope the city is not going to do the concrete work itself. We, we've we had contractors who do really good concrete work around the recent tree plantings, and we've got some really bad concrete work out there that we tried to do ourselves. So Okay, thanks. Yep. Bill, do you or do you, Kurt, know anything about the issues that were just raised? I defer those to Kurt. Um, well, I, I'll speak to District Eight first. We don't have any commitments to new District Eight customers, um, and it is uh, quite an undertaking to tap, uh, put a T into District Eight. It's a pretty specialized work. It takes, you know, a special design that we cannot do in house, um, and so you know that would derail the school street. Uh, schedule if we're going to try to do that with no uh, with an with no commitment of any new connections. So I'm, I guess I would recommend against that. Um, I, I'm not aware of the drainage that um, Mr. Whitaker referenced, but I'm certainly look into it um, and and see if there's something we can do to resolve that. And the sidewalk will be contracted out. We will not be um, performing that with DPW staff. Thanks, Kurt. Folks, anything else, or are we ready to vote? Is there a motion to approve items D, E, F, and G from the consent agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you. Um, now that brings us to item seven, other business, which we had... Uh, decided we're going to devote to a report and discussion of uh, Country Club Road. Uh, start with the city manager. Sure. And we have uh, assistant city manager and police chief, fire chief here, who all involved in this. So uh, first of all, recognize what a difficult situation this is for all involved. Um, city has an encampment response policy, and that's what we attempted to follow. In this situation, we have not and do not go looking for encampments. Uh, we do not seek to, to move people uh, who are being uh, who are camping and not bothering anybody. And there are instances of that occurring around the city in different locations um, regularly. Uh, and camping had been occurring at Country Club Road uh, with really no incidents for a period of time this summer, and that was again, tolerated that there, there is no approved location. Country Club is not an approved campsite, um, nor is any place in the city, uh, nor is any place in any other community near us in the state of Vermont. Um, so certainly recognize the issue. People don't have a place to go and there's no place they're allowed to go, which is why we try to be as uh, accommodating as we can. Uh, what we have done is respond to uh, behavioral issues and what happened over the last few weeks is there were um, behavioral complaints, uh, things stolen, people confronted, um, presence of someone who probably shouldn't have been there based on uh, record, uh, people feeling, uh, people that have been confronted that were working on site. And so those are all issues that are just in our policy. So we asked a uh, good Samaritan who's our partner. And this is typically what we do. They reach out, they do some outreach, and then they will communicate with these people. Nobody has been forcibly removed. Uh, we have not sent the police up to remove anybody. We people have been asked. Good Sam is working with them to try to find another location. 
And, uh, you know, and this is unfortunately what we've seen is that, a few, you know, people come and are doing what they need to do to survive. And then others come and create a situation that is compromised. You know, when people driving cars across the public area, you know, that is a public area that's used for a wide variety of public purposes. And um, so, you know, we try to consider all options, try to be as, as considerate as we can. And uh, like I said, nobody's been... So some, just to address some of the stated concerns I've heard about forcibly uh, evicting, uh, first of all, they're not being evicted there, you know, I guess actually more legally trespassing. There's no legal place there, uh, but certainly have been allowed to exist there um, with good reason, but uh, we've addressed behavior. So that's it. Uh, like I said, we're here. We're happy to take questions. We understand people's concern, listen to comments and uh, as I said, we believe we followed the encampment response policy, but we're certainly happy to listen to other points of view and however the council would like to direct us. Thanks, Bill. Did you want to have the other department? Only if you'd like to hear from them, they may respond to specific questions and comments as they come along. Okay, thanks. So I'll first ask uh, members of council if they have any questions or thoughts at this point, and then we'll open it up to comments and questions from the public. Okay, um, I'll open it up to questions from the public. It's actually uh, always gratifying when something we're doing has uh, brings out a large number of people because we are uh, your government and your representatives. And I'll just, uh, for those who arrived late, our policy is that we ask you to keep your uh, comments to three minutes and we will have uh, a timer uh, tracking tracking that time and Steve, I see you're up first. Yeah, my I have taken the time to request all the internal correspondence and I've read all of it. Uh, I think the sequence of events here and the almost overreaction, it was the city responding to National Life's uh, request for an eviction that brought some bad actors up to some bad behavior of individuals up to the Elks Club property. So in effect, we created or exacerbated a housing emergency with a behavior emergency. Uh, the absurdity of y'all having approved a 18 hole disc golf course there on the consent agenda at your most recent meeting, and then to all of a sudden put up signs that this is a sensitive area, just really speaks volumes. You, it can't be both. You can't have, you've got to re either revoke the disc golf or you got to call it a sensitive area, but you can't claim the whole Elk Club property is a sensitive area prohibited. The assistant city manager's assertion that this is parkland is false. It's not parkland. The parkland hours do not apply. Uh, in effect, we have an emergency. We have to not design. We need a partner that not only manages the easy building, but we need a partner that manages the entire property to create some emergency housing uh, in the tens or dozens more than we currently have plans for. The Good Samaritan contract is for up to 20 people, and that's indoors in a congregate shelter, which is not advised by le the legislators who are funding this or a pandemic. So we need to talk about individual huts in clusters with electricity, modest amount of electricity, not appliances and maintain order with supervised you keep all your junk within your hut you know and this this can be managed it can be heat kept above freezing it's not going to be cozy it's not going to be a hotel room but we need to have ordered the trailers for toilets and showers months ago and you've been i've been reminding you about this for a year and that would that that could potentially be a two-year interim solution with funding from both the Housing Conservation Board and Department of Children and Families. But what we most need to do is cultivate the management entity. And I've been speaking to folks, Mary Moulton, uh, Downstreet, and others. There, there is potential to pull that uh, expanded management capacity beyond what Good Sam is able and willing to do. Uh, and a much more dignified model with privacy and security and look, 
that I think a, I recommend a, a management criteria be that the management entity gets to de decide which individuals go in which clusters so that you don't put the loud drunks it coexisting with the people who are trying to get up and go to work. Thank you. And that's your minute, three minutes. Okay. Hello there, everyone. And again, Hello. everyone, I'll ask to start by uh, introducing yourselves. So I'm Carlton Anderson. Um, I'm I'm just here to let everyone know I'm still looking for a job. Ran for mayor. I was on planning commission. Realized it's the mini monopoly. Um, don't want to be on that. I, I, I love Montpelier. There's a lot of solutions. If you look on the front porch forum that I put on there, I'm a solutionist. There needs to be some type of soft skill liaison between like the streets and the people within City Hall. I just extend my experience, given that I've been home insecure since I was 17, um, and I make broke look good. I'm currently uh, couch surfing now, um, but I'm doing other things with Orca and trying to bring um, the spotlight to Montpelier in a way where we all are individual stars. We just don't know it, and we need the pipeline to money, and content is king. And so rather than taxing everybody, we all we might as well just create something for ourselves. But I'm just voicing – this is not something I like to do. So I'm just doing it because the urgency of some type of action needs to occur because there's a lot of, um, you know – this going on and the action happens on the street and as i always tell people if trickle down economics worked for 40 years we'd all be swimming in it so we have to think of trickle up solutions and i'm just saying i'm here swimming wherever i could talk to you know the unhoused like myself and then also be in stowe early morning talking to a billionaire hiding from wall street it's a very easy conversation because it's not about money. It's just about being conscientious of solutions for human beings. I'm out. Thanks for coming in. Hi, um, I am Kaya. I actually go by Cam most of the time um, or Eddie, I guess. Um, and I wanted to come up here and say how disgusted and appalled I am about how this city is treating their homeless population. They are not allowed to be anywhere. They're not like, like you cannot say we've allowed them to be places. They are, they are people who live in this town. They are, they are our neighbors. They are our friends and we need to treat them with respect. And the fact that um, our police force is trying to force these people out of somewhat safe uh, camping is disgusting. And I hate it. And like, I'm only 16 and I come home from uh, school and I find out that we're doing these things against our neighbors and our friends and people in our community. And I, I can't, I have no words and we need to fix it and we need to fix it now. Thank you. Thank you. It's a fact to follow, but I'm going to try. My name is Rana Gable. I run the overflow shelter for Good Samaritan Haven. Um, and I, I just wanted to take a moment to clarify what supports we have provided. And I have a few questions for you, Bill, um, because I'm a bit unclear about where we go from here. Um, the overflow shelter closed on May 29th. And since that time, seven days a week, either Rick DeAngelis or myself or another staff member, sometimes more than once a day, has been at 203 Country Club Road, delivering water, providing other supports, occasional food deliveries, but mostly check-ins, water, and support. We have, you know, there was an individual staying in that location who had a protracted mental health climate crisis, who we worked diligently with. I've worked with that individual for a number of years through both Good Samaritan and Washington County, I didn't go, I didn't take two vacation days to work to get, for my other job, to work to get that individual into the hospital. 
like we have addressed every situation that we have been aware of as it arose. So my question is, I think it would be helpful. It would be helpful to me. And I'm not asking for this information here, but I would love to see it. It would be helpful to know, you know, dates, times, names of incidents, you know, so that we can really, you know, better plan in the future. But also, where do we go from here? What is the next step? Like what we have told folks was the message that I received from Rick and Julie, who I report to, which is that if folks do not move, that they will be no trespassed. So we moved on Monday, we moved two individuals who are willing to move. Many other folks were unwilling to move. My concern is that on October 1st, we open our doors and we bring people inside. If folks are no, I have a lot of concerns, but for time's sake, I'll limit it to this concern. If folks are no trespassed from that site, it will be incredibly difficult to shelter them if they are no trespassed. So could you speak please to what the next steps will be if folks choose not to move? There's a lot in there, Rona, and I'll, I'll, I may need some assistance with this, but um, first of all, you're correct. And just so that everyone understands, we, we were aware and, and Good Sam has been providing ongoing support. And I think to your point, when did the, the shelter close? What, in May, right? May 29th. May 29th. And so from then until now, there has been people camping and the city has, you know, looked the other way, has has gone along with that. So I want to be clear about that. This is not an anti-camping thing. Um, we did meet with Rick and Julie, I think a week or two ago, to go over the specific incidents and um, and in many cases, you had addressed some of them. Um, no question about it. Um, so ongoing partnership. Uh, we haven't gone so far yet as to to no trespass anybody or to to think that far ahead. We're hoping we can work things out between you and them and that things will work out. We're, we're trying to do this as compassionately as we can. I can't imagine a circumstance in which we would request a no trespass order to have it be uh, effective for someone to use a shelter building. I, I, we would revoke it. We would. I don't know what it takes to. Yeah, I, I can't. I can't foresee a circumstance that somebody who was camping in a place that wasn't allowed wouldn't be allowed, wouldn't be able to go to a shelter where they are allowed. I, I, I don't think that would be an issue. I, I I wouldn't go along with. I would make sure that happened personally. I can't I'm, see that that would happen. That's good to hear. May I just briefly respond? Right. So the mayor. Yeah. What I had heard after that meeting was that specific incidents and names were not provided to that meeting during that meeting. Did I misunderstand something? I thought we had all the incidents, but maybe they didn't give any. I we had the list of all the calls, and I think we gave it to them. So. If not, we certainly can. So what should I be telling people who ask me tonight, tomorrow, the next day, who say, I am unwilling to move? What should I be telling people that the city's response will be? I think you should tell people that we've asked them to move, that they're not authorized to be there. Um, but you and we will try to work with them to find a better location. People, to be clear, people have been offered other locations. I mean, obviously there isn't another location. There isn't a sanctioned spot, but people have been informed that there are, you know, a number of different areas that we will move them to and they're declining to go. I don't, I don't know what you tell them then. I don't have an answer for that right now. Wait, this is a tough situation. So I, I don't know. I mean, I'd want to talk to our team and see what we want to say. Thank you. Thanks for coming out, Rana. Hi, my name is Tanya. Um, and I have um, just kind of a comment on uh, how the whole, how this whole situation was uh, introduced. Um, I would like to point out, you had mentioned that nobody's being evicted, but they are being displaced. Um, and, you know, it's not technically an eviction, but it, it carries with it well, they'll be carrying everything they have with them. Um, and uh, after the past year, I can definitely say that it is not easy to relocate your life, no matter how small you make it. Um, 
my question is, um, I would like to know how we can justify punishing the whole for the actions of a few. As I understand it, for the most part, things have been very uh, chill at that particular encampment until a group of individuals, um, I don't know the, the logistics of it, but as I understand it, um, the problems are recent. And I'm wondering why, rather than dealing with um, uh, you know, rather than dealing with uh, the act illegal actions of an individual on an individual basis, why the entire group needs to move. Um, I appreciate your time. It's a good question. I think in some cases, and I kind of look for a lifeline here from our folks, but I think in some cases we you know, we don't exactly know the exact individual, but I would rather somebody that knows more of what they're talking about answer that question. And you know, we've seen in other circumstances when there's a smaller group of people and it, it is fine and as more and more people come and it becomes an acceptable place to be, it gets larger and it gets harder to manage and becomes dangerous for the people staying there as well as other folks. Uh, and so some of this was, this was starting to go into that situation. Um, you know, we can be reevaluating it as people, as things happen and we can see who's where we want, you know, May I respond really quickly? I Very quickly. I just want to point out that the situation's already dangerous. Simply being homeless is dangerous. Um, and I would really appreciate it if the city would consider that we need a solution that isn't the woods. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, my name is Theo Rodas. I live in Montpelier. Um, I want to say that I think after the past year, after so much focus on Central Vermonters being displaced from their homes due to natural disasters for us now to use displacement of people as the first response to trouble that we're seeing is irrational and an outsized response. Uh, from what I'm hearing, the people who have been causing trouble are people who were directed there by a caseworker working with MPD. And for the first response to be everyone has to leave seems completely unreasonable and seems like an escalation that is totally unnecessary. Um, I don't think it's acceptable that we continue to displace people. I don't think it's acceptable that we expect people to live constantly on the move. And I don't think that that is a quality of life that we should expect people to experience. I think that people have a right to shelter, and if we're not going to provide them shelter, to, to expect them to constantly move around at our convenience is unacceptable as a community. Why was this the first response? Um, there's a lot there. Uh, I don't think they were referred there by police. They were. Is that correct? Uh, Eric Nordenstein from the police department. Um, we have a shared crisis clinician, which we brought in. Uh, and what I learned was at one point they brought that clinician was helping uh, the unhoused get some tents and directing them up that way. As soon as that was resolved, that that was not okay. The, the crux of the matter here is um, at, at, we, we, we're we all on the same page. We want housing for people, not in the woods. So like, we're together from that, okay? So, you know, I don't think we want to, it, to the conversation is we need to find housing, um, not to be angry at each other because we're all on the same team to find the housing. How, how, do we, how do we solve this problem in a room with, you know, 25 people is incredibly challenging, especially with the emotions that are involved. So, so let's, just, let's just take a look at how this evolved, okay? It started out as Country Club Road had a couple people camping and, there's no real issues up there, right? Mm -hmm. And then it became the acceptable place to camp and the and the, the the referred to place to camp by the good Sam, right? So then you have three people to six people to 12 people, now upwards of 15 people. We had some problems that we had to deal with, right? Last night, for instance, we had two people up there, one from Colchester, one from Milton. This is the place where people are being told to go. It took our police staff to go up there, and we had to be backed up by Berlin. Montpelier Ambulance had to go up. They took him to the hospital. 
then the hospital called and Berlin PD had to go back to the hospital. So we're not just dealing with the local folks. It's become the magnet for a lot of different people. So it's really tricky. I think we all want to take care of our people, but it's become a magnet for people from outside of our area as the go-to place. And a lot of it is because we are such a compassionate community. You know, we have people that will do outreach. We, we, we had waves of people here what last month where we we send our outreach workers from the good Sam who are doing incredible work, right? We sent our Washington County crisis clinician who's doing the best she can. And we're sending mobile crisis out there, link people with resources. But at the end of the day, without housing, we have no place to tell them where to go. And that part is tough. And, and I, I hate to say this stuff, but I, I'll tell you exactly my feeling. You know, I, I know everybody wants to vilify the police. I was at a local law enforcement leaders meeting with the governor. I interrupted the governor and told him, I need a building. I need a building. He's like, who is going to staff the building? And I said, don't worry about that. We have good people that will do that. Get me a building. All right. So the police department here is fighting for you guys. So please don't vilify us. Okay. Please don't. Okay. I got another call from the governor's office and had another meeting and we had Bill and them begging for a building. Just give me something and we will staff it. We will build it. We'll make it. We want roofs over these people's heads. We do not want them in the woods, but we have to deal with the behavior in the woods right now. And it's just growing, which is why we're here. So the, the situation, just to follow up on that and, and to your comments, you know, first of all, the first response was not to move people, as, as the chief just mentioned, but folks have been there for a while. But there is a critical mass. You know, we, so I, say a lot of things and I hope they don't come off the wrong way, but in Vermont, the way this, the systems are set up is the state government is really the key agency that's responsible for human services. They provide the funding to all the various agencies. It's really their responsibility. We, you know, pave roads and answer fire calls and, and try to keep peace and do these things. Given the resources, it has fallen to the local governments to sort of become the human services providers. We're sending police officers because we don't have anybody else to do it. We have a shared social worker. That's it. So it's not the police are trying to run off people. It's the only folks we have to go out and interact when something comes and to call for resources. Um, there's not a community in central Vermont or in the state that I'm aware of that has an area that is designated that is allowed for camping. The state of Vermont does not allow encampments on their own property. These are the that's the the agency that is in charge of providing these services. Um, and I'm not trying to pass the blame, but we're in a situation where once something becomes too large, you know, Steve talked about earlier managing circumstances and certainly some kind of housing options, pods, or something would be a great solution if we could find someone to do it. We've been reaching out to all these agencies saying, who could help run this? Once it becomes too large, there are conflicts. We've seen them down on our bike path. We've seen them in other places um, because everyone's homeless for a different reason and there's no one cause. So you have, have different circumstances. We don't have the wherewithal to manage that. And so we get concerned for public safety, including the safety of, and I, and I acknowledge that being out there in general is dangerous, but that being, having too large a congregation of folks without the support and, and, you know, Good Sam has been amazing, their support. We talked to Rick and Julie and, you know, they were clear there's becomes a size beyond which they can handle. And, we mentioned that to the state. Please give these agencies more resources. They're the ones that, that fund, it's not us, to provide these services. So it, it's a horrible situation. Nobody likes it. And um, like I said, that's what, you know, we are not looking, to, the police won't be up there dragging people out of there. We're trying to keep a peaceful situation. We're trying to keep safety for them and for others. Uh, all it's going to take is some negative interaction that goes wrong, uh, whether whether the the young house person is the victim of it or a, a person walking their dog, and we're going to have ten times the amount of people in this room. Uh, so we're trying to prevent those things from happening and still um, and still help in a way that we can that is really honestly beyond our capacity. But the interim solution to building housing 
can't be to scatter and displace people. That like you just said that if people don't go to somewhere else, you're going to serve them with a no trespass. So, so may I ask you a question? I'm not, I don't. I, this is not meant to be argumentative. What what would you recommend is the interim solution? I think that the interim sh solution should, at the very least, be allow people to stay where they are and figure out what resources are needed in order to help de-escalate conflicts and in order to help people. It, even until October 1st, when the shelter opens it, its doors, to find something that will, to find different communicative solutions to make that at all, at, at all sustainable for a month. It, we can't ask people to pick up and leave every time more than 20 people don't have a home. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello all, my name is Azula, my pronouns are she, her. Um, coming here today to express my frustration with the way that the encampment uh, eviction is being handled. And yes, I'm saying the word eviction because when this was brought up, um, y'all said you're not forcefully moving anybody, said it's not an eviction. Um, the th looming threat of a no trespass order to several people who already have precarious legal situations of just a wide spectrum, that is definitely a threat. That is definitely pretty forceful. Um, these folks have nowhere to go. They don't want to leave. Um, frankly, a lot of the issues that um, city council is trying to address by you know, evicting these folks could be resolved by these folks just talking it out. Um, I've visited the encampment multiple times, and when trouble happens, people that are causing trouble are asked to leave. Also, yeah, um, it's it's been repeatedly stated by a lot of folks living there and people that are paying attention to the situation that, yes, a uh, caseworker working with the Montpelier Police Department did bring folks to the encampment that were known to cause conflicts. And now everybody's being asked to move. That feels more like folks just being pushed around from site to site. These folks want to just, like, have a steady place to stay get their lives back together, get on their feet, find housing. This isn't the solution. Um, yeah, I'm just, this is extremely shameful, everyone involved. Um, I want to thank the folks at Good Sam for trying their hardest to actually help out and deliver tents, deliver supplies, try and work with folks on conflicts. Um, I don't know, this is just, uh, this is deeply shameful. Um, also, with the hunger strike going on and the fact that uh, Derek was arrested on Monday right after interviewing with the VT digger about the situation, um, I don't know about y'all, but that feels a little bit fishy to me. Um, if you're going to arrest somebody immediately after they've interviewed about the way in which they're being mistreated by police and by the city government. Um, I want to let folks know that a public records request was made last night for all emails, all correspondence involving the encampment at 203 uh, Country Club Road. Um, and that all the uh, PDFs of you know all the emails and everything that is available on vtleaks.org. So if anybody is questioning, you know, how this was handled internally, they can go there. It's under the documents section at the very bottom, as is the arrest footage. Um, so yeah, I just want to say. Uh, this was discussed in an extremely dishonest way um, by all of y'all. Um, I'm deeply ashamed. Uh, this is picking up a lot of traction on social media in town. People are coming by the hunger strike spot to express support. This is an unpopular decision, and y'all should really consider changing it because public pressure will not go down. Thank you. Just, just a couple of comments about that, just about the relocation of people. I want to be clear. Uh, I don't know. This is all news to me about us relocating folks there, so I'll follow up with that. But um, when people are on private property and they ask us to remove people that they are trespassing, and this is you know obviously public property, it's a, and that's why we're having this conversation. So... Again, we don't go looking for people on private property, but when the owner of the private property calls and says somebody is on my property any more than any someone was on someone's front yard, 
then we will go and and move them. It's not because we're looking to do so. Um, so I just want to make that distinction between the relocation and, um, you know, I uh, with regard to the arrest, the gentleman had outstanding warrants and had failed to appear in court and that including an assault charge. Um, and he made himself known. And when we wanted to see who it was we were talking with, and we found it and our police have a duty to arrest people without standing warrants. That's what they're told to do by the courts. So it was terrible timing and looks bad. Um, but that's the case. We would have done that for any outstanding warrant that we found at the time we found it. Thanks, Bill. All right. Um, I just, I just have a few points to make. Could you, could you tell us your name, please? My name is Derek Malbro. Uh, one, um, I have nothing but respect for our authority. Um, yes, it was horrible timing with the arrest, but even when they came to get me, I, there was no resistance. I cooperated, you know, I have great respect for our nation's authorities everywhere. Um, I come from a military family. I served in the United States Army National Guard of Camp Beauregard, Louisiana, 773rd Battalion, doing water rescue from 2013 to the end of 2015. Um, I'm one of the campers up there and I've uh, been on this hunger strike, um, you know, just as a way for me to vent, you know, do something for myself. Um, I come from, a, I'm from Louisiana. Growing up there, we had to fight every single day. Um, I am trying to unlearn a bunch of behaviors because I realized that I don't have to fight anymore. I have a community that will look out for me. And the hunger strike was a way for me to assert my rights without, um, letting myself fall victim to my own temper. Um, it gave me some time to just do my own thing um, and and have, and see my community come together. It helped me feel a lot better, alleviated a bunch of my anger about this. Um, secondly, um, I feel like we're, be we're, given, we're, be we're being given an ultimatum and that's no different than forcing someone to do something. Um, Thirdly, if there's any way that I could help at the site, I am more than willing to go around each and every day and pick up all the trash I see, you know, um, and maintain general maintenance, maintenance of the site. I even volunteer in the community garden with my friend Kale from time to time. Um, so um, I don't just utilize that place to live in. I also take part in the community there actively. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 a it's just really sad that... Uh, we have people there that are trying to make something of their lives. Um, and it's really hard to do that when we keep getting grouped in with the same criminalistic behaviors happening with some of our unhoused community members. Um, also, one more thing. Um, I've spoken with everyone at camp, and it I think everyone's made up their mind that they're not going to move. So... Um, To avoid conflict, I, I've, I've, what I've been hearing is that people just want to stay at their site just until October. Then everybody will pack up, and you know you'll never hear about it again. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Hi, my name is Valerie. I'm, I was, I'm housed, but I was homeless in Montpelier. Um, and it's always so frustrating when there's a natural disaster, something happens in Vermont and we hear Vermont strong and neighbors helping neighbors. And it seems like it's only for the privileged. It's only for people who lost their material goods, their houses and came from some other source and we have GoFundMes and uh, people with money, giving people with money things. And then we have all this influx of people who are losing their housing because they can't afford their rent. Because you know how much rent costs now? I don't know if you know. I don't know if you all own houses that you bought forever ago, but People can't afford their rent anymore. They're not making enough money. And this influx of homelessness isn't going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. And, you know, you might talk about people who aren't from this community coming to this community. That's because there are more people getting displaced from their own communities. 
These are these are not just um, homeless people. These are citizens. These are citizens of Montpelier. These are our neighbors. These are our children who have been experiencing homelessness, who are living homeless, who are going to school homeless. And we're shoving them into the woods or not allowing them into the woods. We're turning our heads because they live in the woods. And I, I don't know if I misinterpreted what you said, but you it sounded like you said, our hands are tied as a city. We have to go to the state to get some kind of funding or help that those people deal with that, not the city. We deal with roads. Is that what you said? What I said was that the way the government is set up, that human services is the primary responsibility of the state, that we don't have built in sort of know-how and capacity. We are trying to address the situation, but the, the Department of Human Services at the state and their funding and their expertise is really the people that would be leading this effort. And frankly, we feel like they've let us down as well, and we're trying to figure it out on our own. So pragmatically, what is the city doing pragmatically to get people housed? Because I can tell you, when I was homeless, nothing is networked. Nothing is networked. Do people know they need to go, like, get a general delivery mailbox so that they can get their paperwork? Do they can? Are people helping them get identification? Are people helping disabled people with paperwork? They're not. Nobody's doing that. Nobody's helping network these services. Nobody's helping. There's nothing pragmatic happening. Well, the city needs to do something about that. We need to recognize what pragmatically is wrong and be start addressing it like a year ago, two years ago. But this problem is not going away. This isn't just about this one incident. Appreciate that. So I just I mentioned that about a month ago in this very room, we had about a two hour discussion with all of our service providers about this very issues before this incident came up, but about the exact same needs. And we have actually done, and I may have let the chief out, uh, you know, we've reached out to partner with organizations with the know-how to do direct outreach to try to connect people with the very services that you're talking about, including Washington County Mental Health, Good Sam, and a few others, including adding our own social worker. You know, we it's, it's far from perfect, but we have added, but it's probably is different from a few years back. And um, we are taking this on because nobody else is, and we are we are amateurs at it. Is there it, someone frankly. on the city council who's connected to that and trying to get the state to get on that, to get funding for this? Because this is a crisis. This is the immediate so, crisis. So, Valerie, maybe I can answer some of your questions because I saw the same problems that you saw, mm -hmm. and I agree with you, the police are not the answer for this. And mm -hmm. I said, we were spoke in the wheel and I will continue to say we're spoke in the wheel, but we needed more resources and they needed to connect. And what we did was we brought all those service providers together mm -hmm. to see what services they were providing to make sure we weren't duplicating those. And the great part of it was once I got it set up, they allowed me to get out because they didn't need the police in there. We needed the, ser the service providers. You need them. us too. They have, they have the breach workers who are peers. So they have those participating in those conversations. So that they had all those and they, they came up with the plan and we've been doing outreach every single day. And what the common theme has been is that the people don't really want the help. And that's- You really need their input. You need their input on what on what's happening. Yeah, that's for the group. Just keep yeah. in mind, I'm trying to, so you're asking who's linking these resources. Mm -hmm. I'm doing the best I can to link the resources in the position that I am. And I'm kind of pushy and I, interrupted the governor and I'm asking for things and we got support from our city leaders. But okay. We're being told no too. So it's really tricky for us. And we are, you know, if you listen to the city manager, we don't have the infrastructure, the setup, the personnel, the staff to handle this. I am being completely overrun. And I've told everybody here, I need help. I need help. Right. And I'll be the first to admit, we are not equipped to deal with this by ourselves. And that's why I've continued to reach out for help. Our calls are over 900 year to date more than the year before. And I'm doing three less cops. I'm burning up the cops. I'm afraid I'm going to lose some of them because it's what we deal with. And what happens when we lose them? More cops are going to have to deal with the same number. And then I'm going to burn them out and they're going to go. And we were already down to 11 at one point. I have to, I have to, I have to handle this. 
Okay. And we had the same experience with our, you know, fire and ambulance people too, getting tons of calls to medical emergencies. Even our DPW has been called to clean up encampments. And these are all things that, you know, they typically don't do. We are trying to do what we can do within the abilities that we have. And we are, we are in uncharted waters. We do need a support organization. And thus far, I, you know, I'm ha happy to hear that there's been conversations uh, happening, but the the folks we've spoke, spoken with have not indicated that they have the capacity to take this on to manage a site with a lot of people. I wish they did. Okay, thanks, Valerie. Hey, I'm Sophie Haskins. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, we know this problem isn't new. I I grew up in St. Johnsbury, and it was all going on there then. So, you know, there's not enough places for people to live. There's not things that are appropriate for people to live in. And I know that you all ran for your offices knowing that. You all, you know, it's not like you didn't think this was going to be a problem. And so I just want to know if you think that we should be believing that you'll have, you know, you'll be building housing for people. You know, I, I know that you have asserted that, you know, the state has a lot of responsibility in that way, but, you know, you're not the state and I don't expect you to answer for them. Answering for all of you, I, I want to know if, if you think that we should expect that you will be delivering housing for people to live in. Well, I can answer that. The answer is yes. We uh, One of the main selling points for uh, for the city to buy that property at Country Club Road was that it would enable us to, uh, to create new housing there. And we have uh, been in the process of moving to the point where we can work with developers to put three or 400 units of new housing on that property. And it takes time. We have uh, filed our uh, application to amend our growth center designation so that, uh, which is the first step in the process, which you will, will then enable us to uh, apply for uh, tax increment financing uh, designation so we can start to mobilize the funds that uh, we need to put into infrastructure, roads, water lines, sewer lines, that kind of thing, so that we can put housing there. So yes, it's and it's not going to happen overnight, but we have spent a tremendous amount of time at this council over the last couple of years. We've had uh, public uh, public meetings that we've up at uh, up at the clubhouse and and throughout the city and we've had hundreds of uh, residents come to these meetings to uh, talk about what they're interested in seeing there so yeah so we're we're working on it and uh, I, I think respectfully time I you know I hope that that all works out that's you know that's why I voted for it to pass and I and I think it would be great. But we knew that this is a problem now, too, and we know that our solutions have to include now. We can't just say in three years, maybe it'll be better because the toll that that will take on everyone is is not spendable. And if you I again, I think that, you know, coming in that there's a problem that needs an addressing now and it needs an addressing in three years. The three years will be better. The five years will be even better. Hopefully, I would like to believe that. But if we're not seeing sufficient action now, I want you to think about why is it that we should believe you? Well, the action that you've seen now includes the uh, the Welcome Center on the Barry Montpelier Road that uh, city funds went into to uh, to open that up. It involves contracting with uh, Good Samaritan Haven to operate the shelter at uh, Country Club Road. It involves uh, working with the uh, and, and getting more money from state government to to expand that in uh, this year, so that that is happening. Um, is is it enough? It isn't enough, and that's one of the real uh, real problems, which is that the city of Montpelier does not now and is not going to have the resources to end homelessness in the city of Montpelier. If we just look at the resources that the city of Montpelier has and the ability, the, our capacity to 
uh, raise taxes on our residents to uh, no matter what we do, that is not enough in its own on its own to uh, to eliminate how homelessness in Montpelier. And so that's why the city manager keeps talking about well, and chief keeps talking about what well, we need to we have been and we will continue to push state government to mobilize more uh, resources to us because uh, just you know, they're not letting people uh, camp out on their property either. And and the, the, the state owns a lot of uh, real estate in Montpelier, some of which could potentially be used for housing or shelter space. Just one more thing to that, too, because I think that's a fair question. Uh, first of all, housing doesn't happen overnight, regardless of how fast. And, and you know, we, the city, will not be building housing. We're not. That's so we shouldn't thing. believe that you all will be responsible for making sure. No, I didn't say that. I said we don't. We're not builders. We would arrange for people to do that. But what I was going to say is that you should realize that um, the housing that's at, at uh, the transit center now was a city project that we put together. That was 40 units of housing. The housing above Old Bichon's uh, was a downstreet project that we put funds in and helped partner to make happen. So we have taken actions already to create housing in the city and are continuing to do so. Buying a $3 million piece of property to create housing was a pretty aggressive move, actually, and it does take some time. But to your point, you know, we were talking with the governor's office yesterday, and actually I wish you'd been on the call because you're saying exactly what we were saying because they were, you know, talking about the need for more permanent housing. And we said, we can't agree with you more. Can you provide us funding to get it started? Well, you know, not, you know, maybe we could put it in next year's thing. And then we said, what do we do with the folks that are in tents right now? We've got a problem now. Where are you? You know, we mentioned a couple of buildings that they own that are, and said, why don't, yeah, I, you know, they'll, they're going to get back to us. So I, I appreciate it. I mean, we're very- You all have a moral responsibility to handle this now. And I think you like you continue to stay in these positions because you believe that you're doing, you know, for the greater good. And I think you need to know that we know that you're not. Appreciate that. Where would where would you have us build housing and how fast would you have, and how would you do it? I think, you know, the country club space is a great spot. I think that the college green, I think that the, the problem here is that you know, I think that the moral responsibility involves things that are very against the way that we have believed is okay to do business. We should be confiscating land. We should be, you know, we should be the town, the city is us. We should be building houses. It shouldn't be making people rich building them. Agree. You know, that this is one of the big things of how do we support projects that aren't just about making, you know, stone and browning more money. I, you know, it's, the the moral things here, I understand that you're constrained by the legal system that you're in and you're choosing to participate in it. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Is it okay if I ask a question real quick? Yeah. Okay, so you have said um, that like they're not allowed to be there at the moment, like at the, at the um, campsite. My question is where are they going to go? Where, where would they go that they are allowed to be in? Because because I can answer that for you. It's nowhere because you're never going to let them stay in one spot to get their stuff together enough to be able to um, buy a house, get a job. Because I'll let you know one thing. Um, you can't get a job without a house easily. And you can't get a house without a job. Um which that's a paradox and and that's a not okay paradox um but that is the system we live in and it's a problem so my question is where are they going to go all right because they can't go into hubbard park they can't go go into the um the park above or below national life they can't camp, camp out on the state house they can't camp on the streets they can't camp um on the bike path, where are they going to go? Because the overflow shelter only takes so many people. And also it is, I, from what I've heard, it's not the best solution, especially with the number of homeless people in this town. Um, and it is not the safest solution for some of those people. Um, I need to know where they are going to go. Because if you were going to displace someone and tell them they can't sleep anywhere, where are they going to sleep? Where are they going to live? 
Thank you. I just want to pause in case there's an answer to that question or if that was. Oh, well, I mean, I think it's a fair question and a difficult one. We do, you know, we have an encampment policy that de describes circumstances under which camping will be tolerated. And there are places uh, in the city where people are camping that they are not being moved. Um, there are places in the woods in Hubbard Park where people are that have been for extended periods of time. Um, I don't think it's difficult at all. Actually, okay. I have several okay. ideas, but again, I'm only 16. Okay, thank you. Sir. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Clementine Noon. I hate public speaking, so I'm going to like shake it out a little bit. Um, but I, you know, this was the first, I've lived in Montpelier for almost three years. And I've been really disappointed with some of the trends in Montpelier for almost three years, but uh, this was the first time I'm showing up and doing uncomfortable public speaking. So um, I, I hope that in conjunction with everyone who showed up today um, is uh, uh, saying something. Um, and I just want to start with like my personal feelings of like disappointment, like watching this uh, series of events develop. Like we all have kind of acknowledged as much, but um, I just wanted to add like, on Friday was when I read the VT Digger article about this situation at the country club. And it was the same time that I saw another headline for um, President Biden doing a uh, emergency declaration for the uh, tropical storm Debbie that was coming into Vermont. And it was at the same time that I was reading the updates from the city about the uh, forecasts for our flood gauges and the rain and uh, at the same time as I was concerned about living in a floodplain and um, all the kind of, you know, fears that, and trauma that had come up, not just from our experience of flooding last year, but also one month earlier, uh, seeing our neighbors in Plainfield and such um, deal with such devastation. So right as I was starting to get concerned about, you know, my own situation and watching the flood, the forecasts and seeing Biden do this emergency declaration was when um, I just felt horrible that my neighbors over at the country club were being dispersed. Um, and these two things were happening at the same time, and it just felt incredibly wrong. And it definitely looked very bad. Um, and I guess I just want to say, um, I, I don't know, I, I want to pause for like sympathy, especially with like the frustrations with wishing that you had more resources from the, the state, um, the sympathy of, um, you know, I, I really know really the great work that Good Sam and uh, Downstreet does, and we're, we're working on these problem, problems in the long term. I think the Welcome Center is awesome. Like, I, I know that we're, we're all trying to do this, but at the same time, um, you can't you know, meet that those frustrations or those difficulties with just arbitrary solutions. And I, I feel like one of the main problems that's been discussed has been the kind of magnet of people getting together and then problems happening and then we need to disperse them. And uh, the ideal solution from the city's perspective has to come from their policy. It can't just be oh, it would be really convenient for us if everyone was paired off in uh, groups of two or three dispersed everywhere throughout the woods, then we wouldn't have to worry about them. Um, so I'll just end really quickly with, I, I think we've touched on some demands, some things that could change within that policy. That policy was written to be very uh, sympathetic and very empathetic in my opinion. But one of the uh, criteria there in the compliance section is that anyone who's asked to move needs to be offered shelter or referral to shelter. And that is impossible. That policy cannot uh, be complied with at all. Um, so there's cause to update it to reflect that impossibility of referral for shelter or offering of shelter. Um, there's cause to update that policy to include guarantees for protections from those uh, trespassing charges or or whatever could criminalize folks who are homeless. Um, I know you. that uh, it is mentioned in the policy, but it could be protected. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. 
Yeah, I, sh I should point out that uh, we're not. We're we're not arresting or prosecuting people for uh, not having a place to live. And and someone asked me the other day if uh, if this is all because of that Supreme Court decision that says that people can be arrested for uh, for being homeless and sleeping outside. And the answer is absolutely not. You know, that's not everything that every action that's been taken has been direct based on uh, difficult, troubling, troublesome conduct rather than the fact that people are uh, are living outside. Is there anyone, I want to get back to the council. I want to give other people who've not uh, had a chance to speak, but would like to speak either in the room or online to uh, to speak, and then I'll uh, bring it back to the uh, members of the council. Bill, have you thought any thoughts that you want to? Uh... Okay, members of the council. Steve, you have spoken. Um, okay. Ask somebody to take curve down so we can see the other faces that are there. Okay, thanks. All right. I I was going to, I'll start out. I was going to say some of what I already said is what, uh, what I was going to say in summary, which is that we, the city for years has worked on uh, developing resources. We will continue to develop resources. Uh, we we are devoting uh, state or city funds to things like providing services to people who are uh, who are unhoused and providing services to providing like a clinician to the uh, police department because we know that this is not. A law enforcement problem, and I know that uh, talking to the chief, he's not interested in treating this as a law enforcement problem. This is not—you can't arrest yourself out of a homeless homelessness crisis, but uh, we can definitely provide the resources within our capacity to uh, to help direct services to people. We do have uh, the city itself is not a network of uh, service providers, but we have uh, worked with service providers to make sure that network, including uh, our social worker that we shared, we shared with Barry, uh, the Good Samaritan Haven, Washington County Mental Health, and other entities are there to uh, to provide services and, and links to, uh, to people who need the services. And I know they're going to continue to do that. I see. Uh, see, Julie's on the uh, or Julie Bond is on the call um, now. Other people, you know, Rick DeAngelis has been to meetings many times, uh, talking about what uh, what they've been doing for for our our neighbors, and and we're, and we're going to continue to do that. Um, there is no. no instantaneous solution to this and we uh, we definitely um uh, i i take the uh, the point the last speaker made that uh, maybe we should reexamine the uh, our policy as uh, as a constructive solution and 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 we can do that we can ask the city manager and uh, leadership to do that to see if there's any uh, any amendments or improvements that could be made, um, but we don't we don't have the answer tonight, and we're not going to fix everything uh, in one meeting. And I'm happy to hear, more, uh, Adrian. Hi, my name is Adrian Gill. Thank you all for being here tonight and being very brave and standing up and sharing your thoughts and um, ideas. I've you know, I'm not an expert in homelessness. I've, I've been a 
impacted by it by people that I know and that I have supported um, in that area um, currently. And it is really, really difficult. It is a complex issue that the world is trying to solve. And I think the city has a role in this and we're not going to solve it through the city of Montpelier, but I think what we could do, um, you know, is just continue to enhance our partnerships. It's going to come through partnerships and working with the state and good Sam and everything that we're currently doing. Um, we do have two committees, um, in the city. We have our, um, housing committee and we have a homelessness committee. And so I would love to explore really charging those two committees to, I mean, I know this is what they, what they do. I know the home, uh, the housing committee is looking at housing opportunities. They're, they're exploring all different types of housing. The homelessness committee is, is, is led by um, good Sam. And, and this is what they deal with every day. I would love to see those two committees come together to forge a even a temporary partnership because um, they're working on similar topics, but they're not talking. And so really having that opportunity to come together with those two city committees and explore, you know, there are best practices that have been, you know, tried in Vermont. Um, we can learn from those lessons. You know, we can look at Burlington. You talked about, um, you know, reaching out to organizations with pods, you know, there's not the capacity, no one wants to manage those, um, but maybe we charge those two committees to do some research um, and find out what has worked, what hasn't worked in the cities of Vermont and across the country, figure out the cost. Joe Biden, um, our president, just set aside money through the HUD Foundation of federal funds to reduce the red tape to accelerate these, these projects for housing because it is a national crisis. And so how can we um, you know, capitalize on those funds? How can we bring them to Vermont? We have a grant writing committee that would love to write some grants. Um, so let's utilize the resources that we currently have and be very, very focused and very targeted on some solutions um, that will work for our community. Um, I've heard that the shelters, you know, are, are a part of this complex puzzle, but people want more. They want a place to, to live and not, you know, there's permanent housing, there's temporary housing, but, you know, being in a shelter with cots, you know, across the room is not for everybody, especially post pandemic. It's not, you know, a safe place for, for, for health reasons. Um, and so looking at multi-tiered solutions from a shelter to pod solutions to, you know, wraparound services that we're trying to provide with our, our you know, crisis center, our social services, working with the state and Washington County, and then transitioning folks to permanent housing, which we're also trying to do. So it's a multi-layered process. It's a multi-step process, but I'm hearing that we want housing now. The city owns land. So is that an opportunity to provide, you know, temporary, you know, more temporary housing until we find those developers to build houses? So that's not going to be built on for another one to two years. So what can we do in the interim to provide our folks with secure housing? Those are some thoughts that I'm trying to sort of, you know, work through. <laughs> Thanks, Adrian. Lauren. Yeah, thanks. And just just echo, really grateful for people coming in, sharing your perspectives, really important and impactful. Um, I Yeah, I, I, I like Adrian's idea of trying to, you know, there's a whole bunch of solutions we need to be looking at, and we need to deal with the immediate crisis in front of us and know that a bunch more people are going to become unhoused shortly as more people are kicked out of the motel program. And so, you know, as everybody has said, it's it's not going anywhere and it's not getting better. It's going to get worse in the short term. We know this. So what are we doing? Um, I mean, if we put together, you know, like a really short charge of like, you know, come back in one month with some tangible solutions, um, part of it could be looking at our policy. I definitely want to make sure we're not criminalizing homelessness. I think that's what our policy says, but let's make sure that there's nothing that we're doing that is pulling people into the criminal justice system just because they're unhoused. And I, I know that was our goal writing it. So hopefully like we can make sure and just make, you know, just, it was written a few years ago, so it probably should just be, you know, reviewed and updated. Um, 
one recommendation if we're going to do this committee, like I want a state person there. They have money. They, you know, there was somebody who came to a meeting a couple of weeks ago, one of our city council meetings and said there's state grants. It sounded like there's a bunch of kind of criteria that you have to meet, you know, in order to get it. Let's make sure somebody is at the table. So as we're trying to come up with solutions, we know that it's the kind of solution the state will actually fund. We can get money, we can get resources and, um, you know, hopefully they would commit to that. I mean, maybe we could get state funds to train people who are currently unhoused and unemployed to work at these facilities. This is what we keep hearing as a huge issue is there's just nobody to work. There's people who don't have jobs right now. Like, can we, so maybe there's ways that we can try to get some resources to, um, to bring to bear to, yeah, from the state, you know, in partnership with Good Sam and, you know, let's, let's get more creative. I mean, yeah, I don't think any, well, speaking for myself, I certainly, you know, I want to be looking for solutions. People need somewhere to be able to be secure, just live their lives without, you know, feeling threatened that they might get moved at any time if they're not doing anything. You know, hopefully we can be focusing on if there's people that are behaving in ways that are becoming problematic that we're dealing with that and not, you know, doing a broad brush approach, you know, and I know our police department takes a very empathetic approach and, you know, just underscore that I know that that's what we want to continue doing. Thanks, Lauren. Anybody else? Okay. Yes, one more comment. You get the last word. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm T. Graham. I uh, have still registered voter in Montpelier. I have lived in a tent in New Hampshire, um, and I'm uh, currently in low-income housing. And I think just kind of replying to... Um, something that the chief was saying about um some folks not wanting help i i just um i want to kind of remind everybody to approach that issue with a certain amount of grace because as we said this is a national thing right people are being um displaced all the time mostly by police or you know militia in in a lot of red states and um even when they are put into shelter systems in a lot of places around the country. I mean, somebody mentioned coming to Louisiana. I know a, a lot of the, um, I know some folks in, who dealt with this stuff in LA County um, where there are sheriffs who are literally in criminal gangs. Um, and, and when you have folks who have dealt with services that, that take that form of violence and abuse and, and sexual abuse, in some cases, there, there are places where, the things that that come packaged as help and are talked about in the same kind of language. I'm not accusing you folks of this, but people are coming from places where they have an enormous amount of trauma and severe PTSD from having dealt with help. And so there's a reason that some folks are refusing help. And, and so we just want to make sure we're not villainizing and criminalizing that and approach those folks with grace because they, they have good reasons to be distrustful. And so sometimes you know, um, it, it, even with the best of intentions, what 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 some folks in this in these situations are hoping for most of all is just to be left alone, and that is that's a cheap solution. Doesn't cost you a nickel, and um, and yeah, for for some of these folks, that's just what they want more than anything is just to not have anybody bother them because because they've been so badly bothered mostly by city employees all over the country, and they're they're sick of it, and that's why I think a lot of folks don't want to move from where they are because. They, every, they just keep getting moved and, and there's so much trauma around it. And it's like, finally, maybe, finally, I have a place where I can just not have that happen again. And then now it's being maybe taken away by, as a result of apparently, you know, it, it, I don't think, I'm not saying that that folks being moved from national life to here and then causing problems, that was deliberate. But you can maybe understand how someone dealing with paranoia and loss of sleep and all this trauma might suspect that it's deliberate. And so it feels, it feels violent even when you're trying to, to help them in this situation and so you know as much as much grace for that kind of trauma that people have is i think very recommended thanks thanks, thanks. <clears throat> oh and i see that we know have, have a couple more people uh, online julie hey there um julie bond from good samaritan haven um, I wasn't sure about the queue there because it's hard to see it on the web here. So apologies. Um, but thanks for everybody's comments. You know, this is truly, as many folks have said, it's a it is a larger problem. This is a, a not our community alone, you know, it's national systemic 
it is it is huge. And so, you know, as a result, Good Sam has tried to grow tremendously to to respond to that to that issue, to the needs. Um, we continue to do that every day. You know, we're we're trying creative solutions, many ideas, you know, on a daily basis. Um, and that include, includes trying to get some creative solutions to increasing shelter capacity, improving different models of the provision of care and so on. Um, and, you know, the city's responded in a great many ways. As Bill and Jack described, you know, we've worked for many years together on this. We continue to partner. It continues to be a challenge. It's because it is so, so, so complex. I cannot underscore the complexity of of this uh, situation, just as the gentleman previously um, described. There, there are many reasons for that, right? From from those experiencing homelessness to those uh, providing care and, and attempting to provide solution in emergency housing, for for example. Um, you know, but folks responding to the crisis are tired. You know, there's there is compassion fatigue out there. You know, um, there's been a lot of effort put forth um, tirelessly every day. You know, our teams, the city's teams, so many uh, community partners um, around around our community, the state, the country, and so on. So it, there is that too. You know, so let's put that in in the mix. You know, but among all the complexities, we need to all remain partners. You know, public service providers, the city. Um, and direct our energy to the institutions, to the systems of power and with resource, you know, to make change that's broader, you know, from state levels, federal levels, and so on. But, you know, change in terms of new housing, change in terms of new initiatives, enabling new shelters to start, it takes time. That is a timeline, right, that has a longer period of time than, than we all know needs to happen right now. I, I understand some folks are saying we need it immediately. Yes, we do. Absolutely. Um, but we're not giving up on those things either, right? We're not giving up on the parallel paths, the short-term ones, immediate, the mid and the long-term ones, because housing takes time. Shelters, putting them up takes a lot of time as well. Um, you know, so I, I do invite folks to, to, if, you know, we're all here because we care about the same thing, you know, we may be saying it in different ways or, or coming from different organizations and entities that are, um, have different scopes of work, right? But we're here because we care and we believe in this and we believe that we need solutions. Um, so I do invite people to come and, and join in the effort. It's complex work. It's amazing work. It's hard work. Um, but come join us in our efforts to provide the solutions and, and be service providers. Um, we welcome you, you know, so thank you. Thanks, Julie. And thanks for everything you've been doing. Thanks. Uh, Meredith. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm going to leave my video off cause I have a unstable connection. Um, my name is Meredith Warner. I'm the interim co-chair of the homelessness task force. And I'm also a staff person at Good Samaritan Haven. Um, so I just wanted to name that I'm here. I appreciate really, especially what Adrian was saying, the notion of the of the council coming to the task force with a specific, specific charge around this issue. I also love the idea of the task force uh, collaborating with housing, uh, the housing committee to think about uh, potential solutions in the future and how we can work together. Um, you know, the, it's an important moment at the task force. There's been a lot of uh, turnover in terms of who's on the task force. And this September 4th on Wednesday, the task force is meeting to really set our priorities for the coming year. So we're at this really opportune moment, I think, for the task force to support the needs of the city and uh, provide some research capacity and some energy around how, uh, what's possible. Um, so I just invite you to uh, the council to bring that work to the task force. And um, and I appreciate everybody who's out here tonight speaking uh, and um, really holding space for the folks who are sleeping outside tonight. So thank you. Thanks, Meredith. Um, Christina. Hi, thank you. I was having trouble trouble raising my hand. So thank you for taking my comment. I do want to thank everyone for speaking and being here and listening. Um, and I really want to thank um, Good Samaritan, Another Way. I live right near Another Way, and they are amazing. And the staff, the, the people who interact with those services, 
Um, I bring my dog um, up to the golf course. Um, we enjoy going up there. It's a beautiful space. Um, and we have, I've had great interactions with the folks camping up there. Obviously, it's not ideal that we have to um, have people living in spaces um, that isn't meant to be lived in in that way. Um, but obviously, it's amazing to see the community come together there. And I really don't want to break up that community if we don't have to. Um, I really appreciate folks um, providing solutions and hearing uh, people out. Um, and I want to say, you know, I, I we need those immediate solutions, as folks have said many times, so I won't hammer that point again. Um, so looking into where we can place people right now before October would really, I think, be should be priority number one. Um, and I also um, could see and hear a common theme among our discussion here where folks who are directly or indirectly involved, uh, there are not enough uh, supports, whether it's financial, uh, staff, people, um, local, just community support for this work. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, we were all hitting on the point, or many were, that the governor's office is a the perfect place to bring your concerns and push for this. I think this forum is great, like I said, and people should continue to speak up here to these to this city council. And but the governor's office and the administration really should be held accountable. Um, we knew that this um, this housing was going to get worse. Uh, we know that funding has been put in for housing. Like folks said, it does not happen overnight, um, and nor should it. It should be built properly um, and safe um, for people. Um, but the governor's office really should be held accountable um, for not funding these services properly, whether it's um, our local police department, um, the staff at these uh, organizations, um, you know, social services, whatever it may be. It takes a whole system su to support our community. And I think people who spoke here tonight and others should really take their concerns straight to the governor's office, whether it's calling, emailing. Um, we are in an election year, and I think that if enough people reach out, they will hear and they will hopefully respond and by supporting everyone, including the folks here. Um, so I know that's not in the immediate, but yet it well, it does work and it could work. And I think it's great that the people who work on it directly speak up to the governor. I really appreciated hearing that, but we really need everyday people to also be reaching out because they do listen. And if enough people reach out, things can change. Um, so I just wanted to share that because that was a very common theme here. Um, and I would like to just kind of call out the governor's office for the lack of leadership uh, for this issue. Thanks, Christina. Okay, I think that wraps up this discussion. I appreciate everyone who uh, who participated and uh, thanks for coming. This is not the last word uh, that we'll have on this. And so we'll keep going. Thanks everybody. Next up, city council reports. Um, Starting on this end, Adrian. Um, so I will just encourage everyone to attend the World Soccer Festival on Saturday. Um, it's at the high school. It's bringing in folks from around central Vermont to celebrate soccer, which is a good, fun recreation activity for everyone. There will be tournaments and um, just a fun way to get out and celebrate Montpelier and, and be a part of the recreation environment. What's the weather supposed to be like this weekend? What? What's the weather supposed to be like? I don't know. Probably rain. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just see. I'm checking. My pessimistic side. Yeah, that's kind of what it looks like. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, uh, Carrie. Tim? Conversations. The Housing Committee has had a couple really good sessions, good meetings. Um, most recently, Tess Taylor from Berry City, Jesse Baker from South Burlington, Jasmine Hurley from Winooski, and today Chip Sawyer from St. Albans all did uh, Zoom meetings with members of the Housing Committee to talk about things that they've been successful doing to create housing in their community. So hopefully we can pull some good ideas from them and maybe they, they would help at least flushing out ideas. Uh, they were very exciting calls. It was good. Yeah. Uh, Palin? No report. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Lauren? Just wanted to thank everyone who voted yesterday. Thanks to everyone who volunteered and the city clerk's office. Another successful election.
go democracy. <laughs> Thanks for participating to everyone who did. Okay. Um, not much to say. I, I was, um, Adrian and I were also at that uh, housing committee meeting last week that Tim mentioned, and uh, I got some ideas that I've mentioned to the city manager already and things that ideas that I think we will be, Oh, Carrie, you were there too. Sorry. And that we will be, uh, <clears throat> that can probably seed uh, future conversations. Um, so there, there are ideas out there and uh, I can also say that we, Montpelier itself got, uh, got some credit for some of the good things that we've already done uh, in the housing area. Um, I'll just observe that, uh, you know, tonight was, tonight well, wouldn't have happened in the ordinary course of things. It was, we, we scheduled this for, for, a, for a very quick meeting, a special meeting to uh, deal with a couple of items that had to be dealt with tonight. And uh, I'm glad we were able to make the time to uh, discuss this uh, very important and pressing issue and um, we'll, we'll be back. City Clerk. Yeah, I wonder if you all can indulge me a little bit. I thought this was going to be, I knew this was planned as a quickie meeting, so I didn't know that the warrant warrants were going to be on it at all. So I did not bring the book and I've been looking for a chance to sneak out of here and get it, but I haven't had one. So I wonder if I might ask you, you all it? to stay a little later so you can sign it. Sure. I'll dash and get it right now and catch up with what and do you have. Said. Do you have anything else? Do you have any reports on the election or anything? To reports talk about? on the election. Turnout was low. I will give that report, which is really interesting, but it was low around the, uh, around the state, with the exception, I hear, of Calus. Um, but they had a, an extra race going on. But uh, yeah, so this this election didn't fire people up, but I'm sure November will, and we'll make up for it. And the volunteers were amazing. Once again, I don't know, I don't know how I could do this in another town, because without the volunteer crowd that I can always count on, it's sort of unreal. Um, I mean, I'm having to. I've had, I'm having to turn some volunteers down and say, you know, wait, don't forget me in November when I'm really going to need the help. Um, you might all not. Get. You might not remember that years ago, before you were the city clerk, what we would do to run the elections was that there was there's a handful of retired people who would come out and we would pay them to sit there at the polls and do that, and and that was fine, but having the the volunteers come out i think it's just great and, oh, i remember that that was the way it was when i started yeah yeah and everybody pretty much universally enjoys it yeah they seem to that's great all right thanks kelly oh, got the oh, C got city manager's report okay good now i don't have to filibuster um <laughs> uh, interestingly i guess there's a, a little bit of irony that the original purpose for uh, calling this meeting tonight was to review a development agreement to jumpstart some housing. Um, and we weren't uh, able to get that all together. So uh, just one of those kind of cool twists. I, you know, most people have left now, but just publicly, I thank everybody who spoke um, from the heart. This is just a, a brutal issue and we hate being in, in these positions because no matter what decision you make isn't a good one. So I really appreciated hearing from everybody. Uh, and other than that, we have a regular meeting on the 28th and back to our regularly scheduled programming after that. That's all I got. Okay. Thank you. And with that, at 6.54 p.m., we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you all.